a retired homicide detective. I've interviewed thousands of people, from serial killers to ministers. Welcome to the interview room. Good evening, everybody, on this wonderful Sunday evening, and welcome to the Interview Room podcast. We are so grateful each and every one of you are here. We want to thank all of our subs and our Patreon members and, of course, our modifiers, our mods who keep this channel classy, Miss Sophia, uh, <clears throat> Miss uh, Teresa M., Maui Girl, and Mimi J2. Without you, uh, none of this could be happening. Uh, because you keep our chat classy and you keep people above the line. As you can tell, we have an amazing panel tonight. I mean, you cannot get a bigger all-star panel than this. If you ask me, Dr. Ann Burgess, and uh, she's a legend. Everybody knows her. Uh, Dr. Gary Bracado, Dr. Catherine Ramsland, and of course, from the Cold Case Foundation, uh, Greg Cooper, the executive director, and Dean, the assistant executive director, and for the sake of time tonight, I'm going to just point everybody to their bios and their books over my right hand, over my right shoulder here. And of course, our special guest tonight uh, is Miss uh, Catherine Klein Rubin. I just want to make sure I, I, I pronounced your name correctly, Catherine. Uh, and so, go ahead. It's Kleiner, K L E. Kleiner. Yes. You see, and that's why I mentioned it. I'm so sorry for that. That's fine. Uh, but I appreciate you correcting me. So this young lady is uh, the author of a new book coming out. It just came out. We're going to tell you guys tonight, you're going to want to read this book. I mean, you need to get over there. Like I talk about Dr. Ramsland's book, Dr. You know, Bricado's book, Dr. Burgess's. Everybody on this panel has a book. Let me tell you that. Okay. And every one of these books is a fascinating read, but this is going to be the very first book by a confirmed survivor of Ted Bundy. And it is a memoir to challenge the popular notion of Ben of Bundy as a handsome killer who charmed his victims into trusting him. Uh, Catherine has, or Kathy has a story and it's gripping. I've, I have I had a chance to go through it. The link to Kathy's book is also going to be below. So what we need to do is make her a, a best, a New York Times bestseller almost instantly. So everybody on this program tonight who's watching this, please get over there and get to uh, get reading it. She's also a motivational speaker who specializes in surviving impact or survivor impact. And since 2018, she has shared her story with audiences around the world. She's been interviewed by just about every major uh, news media outlet. And of course, she lives currently right now uh, around her grandchildren. You've got to love that uh, in South Florida with her sweet husband and her. And you guys have a dog. What's your dog's name? Our, our Gidget. Audience loves your dog. It's Gidget. Gidget. She's a three pound Yorkie. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Uh, so let me start this off tonight, guys, by reading the jacket of Kathy's book. Uh, and this will give you a little sense of where we're going to go here this evening. In January 1978, I slept in my bed at Kyle Omega Sorority Home House at Florida State University as Ted Bundy stalked nearby. He grabbed an oak log from a stack of firewood, slipped through a back door with a broken padlock, and headed upstairs. 
He began twisting doorknobs. Room nine was open. And he quickly and quietly killed one of my sleeping sorority sisters. Across the hall, he found another unlocked door and he murdered again. Then he turned the knob to my bedroom and found it was open. I remember this attack vividly. Bundy was bashing me once in the head with a log and then attacked my roommate. He heard me moaning and came to finish me off. He never let his victims live. But he stopped suddenly when a bright light filled the room. And that moment, he fled the sorority house and in the light, and then the light disappeared. Bundy was my first brush with death, and he wasn't my last. I've long been a survivor. And tonight, we're going to talk about this wonderful human being's life, Miss Catherine Kleiner Rubin, and we are going to learn so much. I know we will. So, Catherine, thank you so very much for being here. First of all, thank you. Uh, you. You are a light. There is no question about that, and I know you're going to change the the temperature of this room uh, this evening. So, Kathy. Let me ask you the, the, the first question tonight that's been on my mind. Okay. Um, can you take us back to that evening in 1978 in the sorority house when your life was changed? Can you share that with us? Yes. On January 14th, it was a Saturday. I, had, I woke up with a terrible hangover from going out partying. But that Saturday, I went to a wedding and was okay enough to drink more at the wedding. Then I decided to go home after that, after having dinner, to study for a calculus test. So I, I went home, got changed, put on my yellow fl uh, flannel nightgown, and laid up in the room studying for calculus. Around 11.30 at night, my roommate and I decided to go to bed. So we turned off our lights, and both of us went to fall asleep. Our bedroom was on the second floor of the sorority house. We faced the back of the house, which is right over the parking lot. Our room was the normal size of a dorm, and we had curtains, a bank of windows on the back of the wall. And our curtains were always open because we had plants hanging off the rods. So our room was always bright and airy during the day, and at night tend to get really dark. So on January 14th, about midnight, going to bed, and I heard something sometime in the morning, and it turned out to be around three in the morning. And I was sound asleep, and I wasn't sure what it was, but it was a door opening and washing around the uh, carpet. So I heard the swish sound. It woke me up a little bit. The next thing I hear is this ruckus or this tripping and stumbling on what was a um, small footlocker that we had between our twin beds. So it was so dark, he tripped over that. Now I'm awake and I'm looking. And all I can see is a silhouette, an outline of a person standing next to me. And I'm trying to squint and look. And all I could see was him as he raised his arm up over his head. And in his hand, he had something, which I didn't know what it was then. But what it was, was a log, a piece of that firewood that he came in when he stole into the house that night. That was the same log that he had killed Margaret Bowman with, whom he attacked first. He went in her room, he strangled her and beat her, and then put the covers right up to her chin so it looked like she was sleeping. When he went to that next room was Lisa Levy. He attacked her, he raped her, he beat her with the club, and he bit her on her buttocks. And that way, that was like a fingerprint so that when they did catch the person who did this, they'd be able to identify him immediately by that bite mark. So he's next to my bed with his hand raised up over his head and he brought it down on my face so hard <clears throat> that it tore my cheek open. I broke my jaw into two places and it shattered my chin and I almost bit my tongue off. It was just hanging on. When I did this, I started making noise my roommate started making noise. So now this person tripped over that little trunk again to make his way over to the other bed. He attacked her with the same log that he used to attack me and my two other sorority sisters. When he came back, 
because he heard I was alive. And Bundy did not leave anyone alive. He killed all his victims. When he came over again, I was in bed and I made myself so small and so little and clenched my eyes. And in my head, if he couldn't see me, he couldn't hit me. So that was my way of, of responding to the first attack. Again, he's in the room, it's blackout. He raises his arm to hit me again. And then all of a sudden, the light shone into the bedroom. It was really a bright light. And what it was, was a car was bringing home a sorority sister from a date. And it was late at night and our windows were open, our shades were wide open and that light bright and shiny in our room. And I opened my eyes and I could see him standing next to me, but he's like fidgety. He got spooked and he ran out our door, ran out of the sorority house. And then the light got dark again and it was all pitch black in my room. And I'm still in this little bitty ball waiting for him to come back. Wow. You know, that that's a lot to take in, even just from the first you know, 11 minutes. I'm, I'm so proud that you're here to tell this story for, to empower uh, so many women around the world. I can, I can hear it coming and feel it coming. Uh, so what I want to do is kind of open up with uh, Dr. Ramsland and Dr. Burgess and then Dr. Bricado. Uh, if you folks have any comments or thoughts based on what we've just heard, and I know you and Dr. Ramsland have known each other for quite some time. So yes. this is, this is a good reunion as well. So Dr. Ramsey, we'll start with you. And then Dr. Burgess, if that's okay, we'll, we'll go around the circle. Okay. Well, I, um, you, I'm sorry, mute. Did I, am I muted? I'm muted. Okay. I'm muted. <laughs> Got it. Um, what, what happened right after that? D who came into your room? Who was able to call? for resources, how did you get out? Because this is a pretty life-threatening um, damage that you have. Tell us, because there are some more dramatic moments coming. So tell us about some yes. of those. Actually, I had passed out when I was waiting for the light to come back, which it wasn't going to, but my roommate was awake and she stumbled out of our door and into the second floor hallway. And as she's doing that, one of the sorority sisters saw her and walked her back into our bedroom. They turned on the light and they now saw me as I'm huddled in a ball full of blood, blood on the walls, blood on my face. It was all sticky. And she looked at me and they called 911. The next thing I remember are the police officers. They came into my room and they were standing next to me. And I remember opening my eyes and seeing it was a police officer and I felt so safe. I knew that whomever had done this to me was not going to come back with the police officer there. So Karen then went back to her bed as they were tending to her and the paramedics came into the room to help take care of me. And they then carried me down the stairwell and the beautiful wooden staircase and took me out to the front door. Wow. Uh, Dr. Burgess, thoughts? Yes, um, I'm interested in how much you remember and how the memory comes back, because one of the things that when victims are talking, people will say, well, your story keeps changing a little bit and so forth. And and I think yours certainly would be very instructive for you did say that you think you passed out before he comes back. Uh, can you help with that? The memory piece of, of it? Yes. Um, I know when he hit me and um, I think I was just more knocked out than went, you know, um, passed out. It wasn't long though. I could hear him attacking Karen, my roommate. So then when he came back to me, it was like, I have a memory of this. I have a vivid memory. I was put under hypnosis when I was in the hospital, when they took first took me to Tallahassee Memorial. The, the police were asking me questions and my mouth was all wired shut and I had a big bandage around my face. And they wanted to me to help them find this person who did this. Did you know them? What was his name? And I, I didn't know anything. I couldn't remember anything. And I was put under hypnosis. And everything I say now is what happened because I remember being under hypnosis and saying how I heard him walk into the room and trip over the little, the little um, suitcase in the between our beds. And I heard all this and I remembered 
when I did pass out, I had no memory of what was happening the next few minutes. So that's how I knew that I had passed out. But my memory is, is very clear. Um, I've talked about my story a lot and it helps to heal me. So every time I tell my story, I actually put myself right there while it's happening. So I can exactly tell you how it was. How did they find out who did it? He had started to say that. Yes, um, he was actually a uh, gentleman had killed. After he killed us, he went down this person down to Lake City, Florida and killed little Kimberly Leach. And he also bit her. So they had that as, as a fingerprint. He was in, Tala in Pensacola and he was leaving the state in a car that was stolen. So he was stopped on a traffic violation. The police stopped him and he had so many IDs in him, his wallet, that from students, he went to Tallahassee after he left Colorado. He went to Tallahassee because he thought he could be a pass as a student at FSU. So that's the reason he went there. He stole a lot of IDs and um, cards, mm -hmm. credit cards. So when he was leaving Pensacola and they stopped him, they didn't know who he was because he had so many IDs. And back then in 78, they didn't really have uh, fingerprints on file and the computers like they have now. So it was pure um, detective work to say that, you know, we have a victim that was bit and little Kimberly was bit. Let's see if this person has anything to do with both cases. Yeah, very good. <clears throat> okay. Did uh, Dean next? Dean, did you have a... Uh uh, Dr. Bur uh, Burcato and then Greg, okay. and then we'll go to Dean. Yep. Okay. Um, first of all, thank you so much for being on. I mean, this is an extraordinary, extraordinary experience for all of us to speak with you. And what you've been through is unfathomable. Um, now, one of the things I found myself wondering about is I, I know that um, when you were attacked, the responders um, thought that you might have been shot at point blank range because of the injuries that you had sustained and you were unable to speak uh, because of the tongue and the jaw and all that. So one of the things I've wondered about is how did you rehabilitate that ability? You speak so clearly and so obvious that you have overcome that. I was curious what happened with that, how you were able to overcome that horrendous injury. And the other thing, I was hoping you could shed some light on that I've always wondered about is, did you guys, do, do you feel that that sorority house was targeted by Bundy or did it just feel like he found some vulnerability in that building, you know, thought that, you know, there were young women in there and they would make, you know, and sort of impulsively did it because there is something about that Chi Omega attack. And I think the Kimberly Leach attack that suggests a kind of a deterioration where he was getting more and more, wild and disorganized and you know and primitive in in the way he was attacking people i mean the log and the biting and etc and i'm just curious what your thoughts are but i but i really really would appreciate hearing a little bit about how you overcame that those terrible injuries in terms of speech and all that it took a while um i was wired shut for nine weeks my jaw actually was when it was broken in tallahassee they wired it shut but then when I went down to Miami to be uh, recuperate, my parents took me to a dentist and it turned out that my jaw would have been set and my teeth would have been crooked. It was the jaw would not have been set straight. So they had to re-break my jaw after three weeks of it healing and they wired it shut again. So it was a total of nine weeks that I was wired shut and I could only eat what I could drink through a straw. After the attack, my teeth were shifted and loose after the uh, the first attack. And I was able to drink liquids for nine weeks, but I wanted to talk and I would talk as much as I could with my teeth clenched. That didn't stop me from talking. It was just harder to understand me. And as I was getting better and knew that I was going to be able to keep going, one of the things that I did have a problem with was when I was attacked, I had this terrible black feeling around me, just like a black shoulder, 
a black cape around me. And I was always scared because I didn't know what that cape was or was it going to keep with me all my life. And I knew I didn't want to look like that. I wanted to get better. I wanted to leave the house and I wanted to live again. Mm. When my jaw was wired shut and I couldn't talk to anybody, it was so hard to communicate. But I had this black thing around me. And I, in the distance, in the far distance, I visualized a little island and it had one palm tree and one little beach chair sitting on that island. And it was so far ahead of me, but I took baby steps. That was me going to be, I was going to heal myself. And I took baby steps. And as I looked behind me, that black mass were baby steps behind me. And I walked, and I don't know how long it took, maybe a month a little baby steps to actually visualize, visualize this and know this is what I wanted, not just from the uh, things going around the house that I didn't think about daily, but it helped me. And I walked and I walked. And when I got to that little island, I put my feet in the sand and I sat on that chair and I looked in front of me and there was no mass. There was no blackness. I didn't have to be afraid of anything. Mm. Mm. <clears throat> As far as um, him getting away with it, um, it's just unfortunate that he got to this point after being um, taken out of uh, prison when he got um, when he escaped from Colorado, and him coming down to Tallahassee was just on a lark on his part. But um, it, it it happened in my life. It's like, why would this be happening? You know, I I had no reason to know it. And I called my sorority sisters because I had been flown home to Miami and my sorority sisters were all still in Tallahassee and they actually traumatized themselves. This whole thing tragically touched everyone's life. And as I called to get someone to talk to me, I, I wanted to be told I didn't do anything wrong and that I didn't wasn't thrown out of the house. And that's why I had to leave. I needed reassurance. And it was difficult. Um, no one contacted me. But then when I think about it, for the girls, the sorority house, they were traumatized. They were both in their 20s and 21, and they were just having fun at school, as I was before the attack. I was enjoying classes and going to football games, and their lives had to continue. So I'm sure that they continued with their life moving forward and trying to put Kyo and the attack by Ted Bundy behind them. So at that point, I was not someone that they really wanted to talk to. And I kind of got left in the dark on that. Oh. Interesting. Greg, what are your thoughts? Any thoughts? You know, <clears throat> a couple things. I'm really curious, Catherine, uh, also on, you mentioned that you were preparing for this calculus test and, and that you were on a hangover and consumed alcohol. Now, how did that help prepare you for that calculus test? Everybody <laughs> wants to know that. <laughs> well, I didn't get to take the test, so I'm sure I got an A <laughs> if I had taken it. <laughs> <laughs> um, just a, a couple of questions for you. Um, as you just mentioned, oftentimes after somebody has experienced being victimized, uh, they, they often go through this process of, of asking the question why. Why me? Why why my my roommate? Um, why did I survive? Why did others not survive? And and one of the questions we often uh, try to ask those who have gone such through such a horrendous experiences is, is um, to ask: Is there anything after all these years that you've had a chance to review this over and over and over in your mind and? Um, is there anything that you could have imagined that night that any one of the victims, including yourself, may have been able to do to prevent such a thing from happening, whether it be physical security, etc. And then the, the other thing is, um, What do you believe would be, say, the top three things, top three keys to your survival after such a horrible event and throughout your life? Um, to start back, let's go to the beginning on that one as far as why me and feeling that way. 
When I was 13, I was diagnosed with uh, systemic lupus erythematosus, which is a form of lupus that attacks your organs. When I was 13, I was in sixth grade. I took experimental chemo and I lost all my hair. I was homebound for the year and I could look out the window and I could see the kids play. No one could come in and I couldn't leave. My parents worked all day, so I was at my house watching TV, either cartoons or soap operas at that point. And mom would call and ask how I'm doing and, you know, everything's fine, but I would get so lonely. Sometimes I would pick up the phone and dial zero just to speak with the operator. Sometimes she would talk and sometimes they were busy. So I didn't want to live my life in that little house with no hair for the rest of my life. I didn't un understand and comprehend how things change along the way. And I didn't want to be like this forever. I was just like waiting to get better and waiting to get better. My parents were so good to me and took care of me and doted over me, which I didn't appreciate that much, but <laughs> you know, as parents do. Um, but finally at the end of my seventh grade, I got to go out one time. Mama let me go out to church and we went and sat in the back seat, a back of the church. And we went and got ice cream afterwards. And not a week and a half later, I came down with shingles. So now I'm at home. I have no hair and I have shingles all over my face and my neck. It takes a while to get over those. And it was so painful, but I was used to the pain, if that makes any any sense. I was, you know, this was my my burden to bear and I was just going to get through it. Like any child thinks I can, I can do this. And I could, and I did. And I got better. And over the summer of my seventh grade, I became well enough that I could interact with people again. Hmm. And so I went back to school and I started living my life again, not as a little sick kid, but as someone else and whomever else I wanted to be. I joined theater in high school hmm. in the drama department and I've made a bunch of friends. I actually, I met my husband now. I met him in high school, but it was a great time. And I associated people I hadn't done so in a while. And I could act and be anyone I wanted to be, mm -hmm. except that sick little kid that was homebound in seventh grade. So when it was time now to go to college, I chose to go to FSU because in my thoughts and in my um, friends going there and everything, I figured out that FSU was as far away from Miami as my parents lived that I could get and still get in-state tuition. So that was my big, I have to go to FSU now. That was my big, big feeling. But having come through and gone over um, that lupus, I was strong. I knew I was strong. I was, I was, you see something, you want it, you go get it. After the attack, I felt I was strong, but weakened. I, I had done a big major thing to go through and I had, but now I got attacked and that really wore me down. And again, I wasn't going to stay like that. I wasn't going to hide in a box in a room. I wanted to see what was on the other side of next obstacle because it had to be better than what I'd just gone through. So at that point, I'm feeling better because I know I can get better. I know I can do this. And as far as security goes um, in our room, if we had our door locked that night, it would have made a big difference. And if Margaret and Lisa had their doors locked, he probably would have walked down the hall to the person who didn't have their door locked. But by able to attacking them and then attacking me and my roommate and that light shown up in the, in the house in our bedroom and him running out, that was the security I needed because I knew he left. And it's funny because during the um, all the police work, I've talked to several um, districts and everything with cold case and detectives, and they always said, we never thought of a light coming in your room would have made him leave. Mm -hmm. We never go around that way. We always look for the obvious reasons. Why would he have left? What did he do? What did she do? And it turned out to be the light that shone in, in, the, in the room. So I found that interesting, too, that, you know, yeah. investigators need to, detectives need to look around, you know, don't go right for the um, the first thing they think, but to look at the other obstacles. Well, thank you that, for your candid response there. I Did you mention uh, that the light, did you mention what the source of that light was? It was a car that was in the in the um, driveway bringing mm -hmm. home a date that was returning late uh -huh. from, a, 
from a um, date. Mm -hmm. Well, my, uh, my son has had a similar experience with respect to the shingles. At 12 years old, he was, he got shingles and it attacked his eye and trigeminal. He ended up with trigeminal neuralgia from it. Oh. So um, uh, understanding the that level of pain uh, that one goes through, particularly as a child, it, it can be uh, severe. Uh, but so you were drawing on your own personal experiences as a child to that get you believe to get you get through this thing of Bundy. Yeah, I did because I knew I wasn't going to stay down. I was they weren't going to keep me down long. And the yeah. process of recuperation and everything I had to go through, Bundy, that was just something I had to do. That's something I would do. I would get better. So your uh, your personal confidence in yourself as well and your belief system. I do. I had a lot of okay. love, a lot of God, and a lot of family. And with yeah. all everything going on, I got better. Thank you, Kathy. I appreciate yes. it. Dean? Catherine, wow, what a what an amazing story and uh, what an opportunity to speak with you tonight. Uh, your your strength and your tenacity is just uh, mind boggling. I I've had the opportunity to work with so many victims and victims' families over the years, and uh, very remarkable. And uh, what an honor to speak with you tonight. I, I had a thought as you were talking. You mentioned your mom and your dad and. Uh, you know, I could almost imagine you at home, mom calling you from from work and saying, oh, how are you feeling today and doing all that? Can you talk a little bit? Because I, I think people forget that it's not just the initial victim, but it's that rippling effect of from the victim to the extended family to the extended family. Can you comment on kind of how that struck your parents and then how they've coped with that? Um, it struck them hard. I was their little baby. And I was the youngest of three and mom and dad always wanted to take care of me. But I noticed when they called and I wasn't feeling good, I would sit up in the bed and just get right, you know, wide awake and say, oh, everything's fine. Just watching TV. And they're like, OK, if you're sure. And then I'd lay down back in bed and hurt and just wallow a bit. Then when it was time for them to come home from work, I'd get up, I'd put on my shorts and my flip flops and I'd sit in front of the TV watching television. So then what they walked in, I'm like, oh, hi, how you doing? And they had no idea what kind of day I actually had, but I wanted them to feel good. I think I wanted to get better for me, but I also knew I wanted them to feel good. And by being sick and not, you know, telling them I was sick, they knew it, but I didn't want them to be feeling bad for me. They were going through enough, enough of their problems to take care of me. So when this happened, you couldn't hide any of that, right? I mean, this was out there for the world. So how yes. did they deal with that? They um, they were very protective. When I went to anywhere outside um, with, with lupus, mom, uh, one of the things you're, um, you have lupus, you have a chance you shouldn't have children and you shouldn't go out in the sun. And I remember mama used to follow me with an umbrella and I'd be walking with friends in the eighth grade and she'd be right behind me with an umbrella over my head. So I didn't get any sun. So this was her thoughts on how to take care of me. What can I do now? I'll do anything. So um, they doted a lot and I didn't need that. I took it because that's what everyone wants to help. Everyone wants to do something. And when I can't say I want you to do this, they're like, I don't know what to do for you. So you give them a job. Give them something that you want, you know, you can do it, but you just tell them you need help with it. And it makes them feel better. Like they're actually doing something to help me. How long was it till they were notified after the, the attack by Bundy? The night of the attack, I, I've, I don't have firsthand experience on this. So I'm dealing with what my mama told me. They called them like at um, four or five in the morning. They were in Miami and this attack was uh, in Tallahassee. So it was Eastern time. And they called because of all the confusion of what was going on. And they didn't know exactly who was attacked and they didn't know all the particulars. The police weren't sure. They finally got a hold of her and gave her the phone call that no one mother wants to hear her father and that I had been attacked. I was seriously injured and I was in Tallahassee Memorial in intensive care. And I don't know how long it took for them to come to me. It seems like it was forever but I'm sure it was just a day or so. And they got a flight and came to me. And I was in a, a room by myself in the hospital. They didn't know who had done this at that point. And there was a guard standing at my door. 
So I would look around. I was alone in my room and I'd see the police officer standing there. And I'm like, I'm going to be OK. There's a police officer there. So I've had nothing but wonderful experiences with the police, police that were around me and who tended to me. And um, actually, back in, in South Florida, when I first went home to, to Miami to recuperate, someone had posted my name and my address in the Miami Herald, one of the reporters who was trying to contact me. So now I'm listed in the newspaper and all the people in our neighborhood are coming by and people are just driving around the neighborhood because no one knew what happened. A, you know, a local girl attacked in, you know, in Tallahassee. So they actually sent police officers to uh, be in front of the house. And they had one that was stationed right at the front door because, again, they knew that no one knew what had happened or who was who was at fault. And they wanted to keep me safe. But I think if my name and address wasn't in the newspaper, I would have probably felt better. <laughs> but, um, you know, this is the way it happened. That's what happened. And again, the police officers were there for me. You know, uh, what I'm hearing so far, uh, Kathy, is just absolutely uh, amazing. Uh, you're, I, I have three concepts that have come to my mind. And, and then I want to ask you a couple of questions from the investigations perspective. Uh, the first concept is, I think you're a powerful um, um, inspiration towards visual, visualizing the healing process, uh, first of all. I think that's very important for people to understand. Uh, you know, and then the second one, I think you're, you, you have the power of grit. And, you know, you... Yeah, there's an old saying, stick to it till it sticks to you. Okay. Very uh, good. I, I love that one because that's kind of what you're projecting here. And then, of course, the, the third one for me is what I'm getting out of this is you have a vision of hope. Uh, and you've been able to carry that through. Um, so what I, what I would like to ask with those three principles in mind, when you were back in that room that night in 78 and your, you know, repressed memories came back to you through the hypnosis process. Um, could you hear anything, what was going on with him in terms of, was he saying anything? Uh, was he, you know, did you have any idea what he may have been doing to your, to the roommates? I mean, ultimately you learned, you know, the, the horrific crime that he committed, and so that's the first question. And then the second uh, concept behind that, what was that like when you had to see him in the court proceedings as they went on? How did you process that emo emotionally, physically, and, and probably spiritually uh, as you were going through this? Let me answer that one first. Um, right after the attack, he was, um, he went he through, went, through Pensacola, he was arrested and was putting, the police were putting together the uh, the credibility of him being the same as who Kimberly Leach. And he came, they fi figured that it was him so that he, uh, excuse me, some of this is talking good. And <laughs> I'm sorry, just ca get caught up in the moment and what I'm feeling. But okay. um, I, I feel that if he had a sense of what I knew, now that he would have been afraid of me but during hypnosis i did hear the noises i heard him trip over that little footlocker between our beds i did hear the door open up and scrape against the carpet i did see him vividly when i was hypnotized standing next to my bed and raising his arm up i saw that under hypnosis that's why i know it to be true and i talk about it and over time, I think I get more of a clear image or a vision on what exactly happened. But it's it's what I've been saying because it's what happened. And um, to me, the most important part is that he did get caught. And it was only a couple couple weeks after after the attack. When he was taken into custody, he, of course, said he didn't do it. He denied everything. This was in 1978. In 1978, in the middle of in the fall of 78, I was asked to go and do subpoenaed for the deposition. 
And when I went and did that, it was in this big conference room. They flew me from Miami up to Tallahassee and they opened the door. And it was a big conference room with a big, long conference table. And on one side were the defense lawyers and the other side were the prosecution. And they set me at the head of the table and I looked down and there was Ted Bundy at the other end. And he's sitting there and he's looking at me and now I'm just staring at him. I remember what the questions were that I was asked from both sides. It's um, There's a transcript of it. But um, all I remember was looking at him and thinking, you poor thing, you're going to, you know, I had no doubt looking at him and getting his aura around him that this was him. This was him. So that was the deposition. I saw him the first time. The second time I saw him was during the grand jury. And I was subpoenaed to go to the grand jury at that time. Again, he was sitting at a table. And this time I remember vividly, he had a light blue jacket on. And he was sitting with his chin in his arm, in his hands, and just sitting at the end of the table. And again, I wasn't scared. I wasn't feeling he was going to come get me or anything. I just felt honorary. I just, I wanted to get to him. I, I knew I couldn't, but it was just like, he killed my sorority kiss sisters. And I know he killed other women. I just, he, that wasn't going to sit right with me. So the third time I saw him was at the trial. And I was subpoenaed to be a witness. And as I did, I was uh, sworn in. I sat down in the witness box and I looked out over the courtroom and there was a table where the prosecution sat and there was a table where the defense was. And right next to that was Ted Bundy. He didn't look so smug this time. He was like, all right, you're wasting my time. Let's just get over this. I want to go do something else. And it was kind of like, now you're here. And I felt good about it. I really felt good that he was in a courtroom and going to stand up for what he did. And the questions that the defense asked me, and I remember vividly, is they asked me, is this the man you saw in the room that night that was supposed to have attacked you? And I wanted so much to say yes, that this was the man. I wanted to help convict him for all the other women, for me, for Margaret, for Lisa. And I had to say no. I don't know, because I never saw his face. So to me, that was that was hard. That was hard. I had to say no. And I walked out of the courtroom and about threw up because I was upset I couldn't say yes. And I was sad, sad to see him again. It was just a full emotional upheaval of, of thoughts and everything. But that was the last time I saw him. Interesting. Dr. Ann, any thoughts that come to you from what we've heard? I think that is really, uh, cause I was, as I said, I was interested in your memory and that was quite profound that at the trial, even though you looked at him, there was nothing that uh, reminded you of him, his arm or anything. You mentioned how the arm, he would hold that up. Yeah. Yeah. It was so dark. All I saw was the yeah, figure. Right. Did you get anything answered? at the trial or were you just there to t to testify to that amount of, uh, I um goodness? I I'm sorry no I just wondered if you were able to learn anything at the trial of what happened at the trial no there was such a fixation yeah. on him and it's the first time that television was allowed into the courtrooms and I think there was such a glamorous to do about him that that's when the mystique started and that's when the press said, look how gorgeous he is. Look at this. Look at that. And there were actually women, young women at the trial that sat up in the front couple rows. And they were just screaming and ooing and aahing about him. Oh, look, it's him. And I tried to understand why, what, were they, what was this? And I think part of it was that they felt like they could be around someone that was bad and ugly and they couldn't get hurt by it. They wanted to be around the bad boy, but they were safe. You know, they were in a situation where they were not going to be touched. And I think the other reason that some of the women showed up is there was the mother figure that they could help him, that with, with them, they could go and make it better and make him so he wasn't going to be the angry, ugly person. So I think those two things had had, in my mind, 
over the years thought about it. And I think that the young people there were um, so surprising to me. I wasn't expecting to see them. So the identification of Bundy was by the bite mark? Yes. At that time, yeah. Yes. The uh, sheriff in Tallahassee was Ken Casares. He had actually been, done some um, reading and some um, testing on dental implants and dental bites. So this was already something he knew of. And he um, he made sure that the, um, the stains and the bite marks, the integrity weren't messed up so that he could show us both bite marks at the same, I mean, on the same place, but with different bodies. Right. Because they didn't have DNA back then. No, they didn't. Yeah, so that was the bite mark, yeah. Did anyone support you there? Uh, were any of your sorority sisters there? Um, there were some There were some there because they had to testify as well. Oh, okay, okay. So a lot of the girls had to say, you know, if they were home or they weren't home and what they remembered. So it was a long process of getting through all the uh, sorority sisters yeah. doing, doing their testimonies. Yeah. I think I have one other question about yes. because the Chi Omega house was so much in the news, did that in any way affect the sorority or um, what happened? Did you, because you didn't, I take it you didn't go back to FSU or you did? No, I did not. I, uh, my, my, my life took a different, different sure. path. Sure. Yeah. But as far as the university, I tried a couple of times to get in charge uh, in contact with the sorority presidents. And since I hadn't heard back from anyone, I wanted an explanation. I wanted them to tell me why I was left out and why why they thought I did something wrong. And I needed that sisterhood, I felt. Sure. That um I wanted them to surround me and hug me and love me and and it didn't happen. They they didn't for whatever reasons they were living their life. And you know, I was just home alone and in a little box by myself and I didn't have them intervening and helping me. So mm -hmm. I figured that was okay. I didn't need them. Mom says, you have me and your dad, you know? <laughs> mm -hmm. So um, that was okay. I, you know, after years I got over it, but um, I never went to therapy um, as far as after the attack or anything. It was something that mama was Cuban and it's just, you don't talk about your, your things to public people. You just kind of deal with them and, you know, go on. This is probably why I have my strength now, because that's what we've done all our lives is, yeah. you know, you don't talk about your feelings or, you know, what's going on to the people of the public. You just keep so them. How long, how long was it before you really did talk about it? Um, 2018. 2008. Wow. Okay. And, and I only did that because CNN was the first news re, uh, contact me and they asked me to talk. I'm like, Sure, I'll talk because when I talk, I talk to everyone and anyone that I could talk to about, you know, so then the grocery store. So, you know what? I was attacked by Ted Bundy, <laughs> you know, just to start the conversation and get it out there. The more I talked, the better I felt. So um, at this point, it's like I want to talk and I need people to hear me, but it wasn't Kyle Omega sorority. They weren't the ones I needed to reach out to. Or the school. I take it their school. Teachers, uh, yeah. faculty. I just disappeared. What year were you? What year in I was. I was a sophomore. Sophomore. Okay. I was having fun going to frat parties, you know, being a kid. And I had no idea who Ted Bundy, who's that? You know, yeah. I, I had no clue what was going on the West Coast of the United States. <laughs> you know, I was just having fun in my bed where I'm supposed to be at 1130 at night. It's amazing, you know, that you didn't have any support from, uh, hopefully would not happen today that you yeah. get support. Okay, thank you. You're well, welcome. Appreciate it. Dr. Ramson, any thoughts? Yeah, um, there was another young woman also attacked down the street that night, Cheryl Thomas. Have yes. you spoken with her at all? No, I haven't. We've I've reached out a couple times to a couple people through letters and I don't know why. You know, I've reached out to her, but, you know, everyone goes through trauma different. Everyone's going to handle it their way. And for them, possibly not talking about it and not putting themselves with it. That's their way of handling it. I, my she way has, is, she's been in the media, too. She's talking. Yes, about she it. has. But we have never talked together. She's out there. She's doing her thing, which is I, you know, applaud her. So, um, you know, I'd love to talk to her sometime, maybe at, during all this 
settling down, I will contact her. All right. So since you didn't have conversation with her, let me ask you this. I've okay. seen on some social media that you've talked uh, about the way people are glamorizing Bundy because there's a whole new generation now of adoring young girls yeah. who want to be bitten and choked and stabbed by him. They, you yeah. know, they put themselves on TikTok, uh, acting as if they're his victim or his girlfriend. And I know that you've made some very public statements uh, wishing people would stop doing this. Would you want to speak to that? Um, I don't know what's, what's wrong with these women. <laughs> I don't get it as far as I just don't get it. I mean, obviously, I'm not at that mindset, but these women need to get a good life for themselves. They need to go do something productive and not put themselves in this type of situation. It's not going to do them any any good. They're not going to make this make them well because they have, are playing with this. And it, it might even cause problems because someone could be seeing that that they know that might be having mental discussions in themselves and not knowing what's going on what's true and not so to me that's dangerous you are either going to find someone that and they'll find you or i just don't understand it are, are you using your your book tour or podcast or whatever as sort of a platform to address some of this and, and try to diminish it Yes, definitely. Um, I talk about my my well, my serial being a serial survivor. Um, all of this, let me just add, toward the end of my um, third, when I was thirty, I was diagnosed with breast cancer, and I had to go through chemo again and go through all the uh, healing process. And so this was all something that I had to deal with again, and it didn't remind me of the attack. So I had to go back and within myself and know that these three things I'd been through were totally different, but totally the same way I handled them. I was going to get through this. And I want to get through telling people that Bundy was not at all what he says he was. He was very manipulative. He showed people what he wanted to be. He would, during the day, he'd be, you know, fun and charismatic and he wasn't, he was stupid. He couldn't even make it through school. They say he went to law school and he couldn't, he, he failed out his first semester. He was just a loser. He really was during, even during when he was a child and he'd do horrible things and um, to children. And of course, that's a big sign today when young kids are um, are attacking animals and people, but he was just so into himself that he thought he could get away with the evil in him and he could just be, you know, charming young guy looking and they'd never really see him as what he was. Do you think you've changed anyone's mind, any of these girls' minds? I hope so. And if I haven't, I'm going to keep trying. <laughs> okay. Fascinating. And, and Kathy, as you go on with your uh, podcast or your panel or whatever you're going to do, you do realize you have a whole panel of one-on-one -on -one guests here now that you could put on your show there and just absolutely rock the world because your messaging so far uh, out there since 2018, uh, I'm reading the chat comments go by and you are empowering women as you go along here. Okay, so I just want to make you aware of that right up front that you you know you are making a difference, and it's just fascinating to to listen to you and learn from you, Dr. Picado. Uh, over to you. Thoughts? Well, as I've been listening to this, you know, I I realize it becomes something of a meditation on how two people can experience negative life events, and it's sort of the pain brings out the person's underlying character and strengths. In one person, negative experiences bring out a desire to go out and level the playing field by repeatedly killing people and playing out perverse fantasies to get one's ego back. And in another person, negative experiences lead to an incredible altruism and spirituality and acceptance and then going out and sort of <laughs> shedding light 
and um it's really extraordinary uh when you sort of start to see it that way that it's more about a reaction to how what one does with what one is under the worst of circumstances and i i it, it is amazing to listen to you um one of the things i liked best about your book and i do want to emphasize to everybody here i mean i i really think you need to run out and read it it's a it's a terrific book it really is it's it's extremely moving but it also is something of a page turner like because it's very very captivating right i, I was really it was it, it only took about a day and a half to get through the, the whole book this is a really very good book and what i really liked was this challenging of the myth of not only Bundy, but a certain type of serial killer generally, in a way. Because like, for example, um, we talk about these slick, charming psychopaths, you know, who could lure somebody. But you challenge this very directly and you basically say, well, how charming is somebody who hits people who are sleeping or bops people over the back of the head when they have no, there is no charming at all. There's none of that verbal process. I thought that was really interesting. And I wonder if you could talk a little bit about some of these other myths uh, that seem to surround these Bundy and these Bundy type killers. There, there's so many. Um, there's a couple of them that I hear often is that, well, women went with them willingly. You know, he lured them, you know, because of who he was. And one or two were hitchhikers. And back in 78, that was just something everyone did. So, yeah, they willingly got into his car and um, two or three of the others were helping him. He had a cast on his arm and he would ask them to help do something and they'd go in his car to help him. And that's when he hit him with a crowbar. And it was like these things happened because he was physically one to one with them. But hundreds of them were asleep in their bed. The 30 that we talk about are women that we could actually find out and and um, make sure that we were saying their thoughts and their dreams correctly. Each woman had a thought and a dream and a love that they wanted to do. And when you open a book now on Ted Bundy, you open it up and there might be a paragraph with everyone's name in it, comma, everyone's name, comma. It's just a paragraph of names. And that has hurt me so much and so hard because they all had things they wanted to do and, and we bring out their thoughts, their process, give them a voice. They're just, a name isn't good enough. And to say that Bundy put them there in his own way and he was responsible for it and he didn't care. I remember hearing um, one of the, when we were doing all the research, my research uh, co-author, Emily Lebeau Lucchese, did so much work on this and she was brilliant on helping me write the book. I had the thoughts, I said what I wanted to say and she wrote it down so eloquently in the pages. Um, we were a good team together writing the book, but these women are what needed to be brought to, to justice and know that they they have a life and now they hopefully, they have a little voice that, that maybe they have now. Right, you see, you see it's, um, I always was very interested in this ruse of pretending that you need help. You know, my arm is broken. Could you help yeah. me put my sailboat, you know, over there? Yeah. And um, what it seemed like to me psychologically is that the idea was to punish somebody for being kind. In other words, to prove to a person that they were an idiot for being nice, for being kind. Yeah. It's like a way of saying, I'm going to give you a choice. Are you going to say no to a stranger or are you going to be nice? And if you're nice, I'm going to prove to you that that's dumb by hurting you. Yeah. And it makes me wonder why, what hap What would make a person believe that once upon a time they trusted someone and then were cheated or shocked or bopped over the head so that now it has to be projected onto some other poor person? And I think we could, you know, between us all, you know, we know the story of what happened to him and certain things that made him feel that he was cheated and 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 uh, that he was fooled by trusting certain women, the woman that he was very drawn to, that he put on a pedestal, the woman that he thought was his biological sister who was actually his mother, you know, and these kinds of things. But I, but I always had the sense that it had something to do with wanting to say, no, you're the idiot for, for trusting, not me, to restore that sense of ego. And uh, I, I wonder what your thoughts are about that. 
I think women are, are more aware now and um, they should be not to trust a stranger, but understand. And a lot of times I just say, you know, walk in twos. And the other problem I have is walking with a cell phone and they're not even looking around them. They have their cell phone down and anyone can come up behind them and say, look, can you help me with this real quick? And the chances are, yeah, just a minute, you know, and they run right for it without being open to their surroundings and know everything that's that's happening in the in the moment. I remember when I lived, um, I lived downtown and I would walk around and I wasn't on my, I was cautiously not on my phone. I walked to my car and sometimes I would feel someone behind me that I wasn't quite comfortable with. And I just stop, I lean against the wall and I'd let that person walk by me because I figured if he was going to attack me, I saw it coming. So um, that didn't happen often, but when it did, I felt good that I was, I thwarted something, you know, something bad could have happened. But um, I think women need to empower themselves to know that they can take care of themselves if they know what's happening and if they trust someone, but not too much. Mm. Yeah. And uh, before I hand you off to the next person, uh, one other quick question is, you also seem to challenge the notion that Bundy was picking women who had hair parted down the middle and so forth. And this is, this fascinated me because that to me had always been one of the quintessential examples of somebody sort of, you know, going out and finding people who had the look of some prototypical person yeah. that you were angry at. And it's fascinating to hear that it may be a myth. Uh, and uh, so I wonder if you want to ex explode that myth a little bit, because I, I think the audience will find that really interesting and, and i'll hand you off to the next okay yeah. um bundy would sneak into rooms at night to women that were asleep in their bed i was asleep in my bed and i had curly frizzy hair so i didn't match that you know long hair split in the middle a lot of the women did but i think it was by mistake because he always uh, looked for women and, oh, I know this woman lives here and she lives in the basement room and he could get in and out, attack her and take her out. And it was like, how does he do that? How does he actually physically move a body after he's killed it? And most of the time they weren't dead yet and he'd take them out in the woods and then he'd kill them. So actually one or two he left alive for, for days and he'd go back and put makeup on them and then go back and rape them. So this was something I can't comprehend, but not all of his victims had to look the same. It just happened that if you look back in 1978 and you see a lot of college kids, they have long hair part in the middle. So I think it was just his chances of getting women that looked like that were just very common. It wasn't something he was seeking out. Craig, thoughts? Yeah, I, I'm really interested to hear what your thoughts are on uh, those who have been victimized and and unfortunately have sometimes have this tendency to blame themselves or find some level of responsibility for having been victimized. What would you say to them uh, without, obviously, you can take a look at any situation, a set of circumstances an environment in which a crime may have occurred or what specific behaviors may have contributed, uh, what factors uh, may have contributed to becoming a victim. But but that particularly, that, that area that they assume this guilt, shame, and responsibility uh, oftentimes for becoming a victim, to survivors. Survivors. And, yeah. And what, what would you say to them to mitigate that and remove that concept from their minds. Whatever happened to them that put them in this situation, yeah, they're a victim. They might it might be a ongoing victim or it happened in the past, but they need to just calm down. No, it wasn't their fault. Whatever happened, it wasn't their fault. And they need to be able to hold themselves and take a deep breath and just love on themselves and then talk, talk it out to anyone that can hear you, anyone who will listen, even if it's a stranger and you see them and you wanna talk about it, they'll listen. There's people out there who just really wanna help someone and they don't know how, and it's hard to ask for help. 
but by talking, it kind of brings the two people into the conversation. And just be good to yourself. If it's something that's happening now, do whatever you can, of course, to stop it. But understand it's not your fault. Get out of that situation to take care of yourself because only you can do it. You're the only one that can take care of yourself and make you yourself heal and strong again. Yeah, those, that's an excellent observation. Um, what would you say to victims' families, both for those who have survived and those uh, victims who haven't survived? But what would you say to their families on, on how to, uh, to beware, number one, of, of trying to find some responsibility for what had, have, has happened? with the victim um, and also what would you say to them to help them survive they they of course should never say it's your fault to them if you hadn't gone out that night this wouldn't have happened or you know if you hadn't um gone yesterday when i told you not to go then that's why this happened don't put any guilt on that person they're already feeling it enough and once they're a victim the next day they're a survivor yeah. and they need to know that and they need to do whatever they can in their life to survive. They just need to look inside themselves. They all, everyone has a strength inside of us and to pull it out and to actually use it, to depend on that strength and not have to look next door saying, will you take care of me? Yeah. They need to take care of themselves. And as a victim of parent of a victim, they have to know that whatever they live through the vic the victim themselves, that they're at a better place now. They're somewhere else. Whatever was attacking them or hurting them, they're not doing it anymore. So you have to, you can feel sorry for yourself and you can hurt and it'll hurt a long time and it may always hurt, but know the love you had for that person and the way you felt together and things you did together. And I think that it, it'll never stop hurting completely, but just make it so that you can handle it. You can tolerate it. Thank you. Kathy, Kathy, I have to say, I've been in this game 40, maybe 41 years here coming up. I started in 1982. I have, you have inspired me just by the comment you've made. I've never heard a victim say, you know, the next day you are a survivor. Today you're a victim, next day you're a survivor. Yeah. That is so inspiring uh, to hear you say that because uh, you, you are teaching with authenticity and there is there's no better teacher than somebody that can teach with authenticity so i i just think it's awesome and so i'm always the cheerleader kind of guy you know keep <laughs> going you know knock them in the nose if you have to but just you know keep rocking here yeah uh, dean what go ahead i'm sorry i didn't mean to interrupt no, I was just going to say we had talked about um, the police officers and something jumped into my mind um, the night of the attack when the police were there and the paramedics were called. And when they said I had been shot and they wet, wrapped my face up as best they could and they carried me down the wooden staircase out the front door. I remember it was so cold. I went from being inside the house to being all sticky and hurting and not knowing anything. And then I take me out the front door and I'm freezing. And I'm looking around and there are the police lights and there's the ambulance lights turning and there's the fire truck turning and all the uh, radios were squawking. The police were talking to each other. And for a moment, I thought I was at a festival, at a carnival. And in my mind, I looked right down and saw the games and everything in a Ferris wheel. And I'm just laying on my gurney looking out to the side of me. And I see that and I feel good no matter what had happened, I'm going to be okay because I was at my carnival. And then they took me into the ambulance and then they took me to over to the hospital. Wow. Is, is there anywhere he came up? Go ahead, Greg. I'm sorry, oh. Chris. Is there anything that you would tell police officers on how, how to help a victim who suffered uh, something similar to this? What, what kind of reassurance uh, they could give to their client and honestly I, victims are, are their clients aren't they as a victim when you first are in touch with a police officer to me it helped that they were saying you're right you're at a carnival it's okay you know to go along with what i was feeling at that point because they weren't saying no -uh, there's not a carnival here 
because it was making me feel better at my carnival. So I think if, if a trauma happens and the person is talking like I'm at a carnival, they should say, yes, you are. You're at that carnival. And we're going to take care of you. So just not front them up and say, you know, that's not happening. So don't don't challenge them. But yeah. And how about reassuring them of their safety? And just that, they're, that they're you're going to be protected. Okay you're going to be okay. There's more than one here. We're all here and we all ha are here for the same reason. And that's to take care of you and make sure you're going to be safe. Interesting. Two thought, two thoughts to dovetail into what Greg was just saying. Uh, do you have any idea where he got the, the log? How did that, where did that weapon come from? There was a, a bar right next to the sorority house. And there were sisters, sorority sisters, who had actually been to that bar and left and went to the sorority house. This is in the backyard. He probably saw them and the door was broken. So he, they saw him walked right in and he crept in. He had dark clothes. And right where the door is to go inside the, the um, rec room, there was a pile of firewood that we had to use in our fireplace. So he just bent down, pick up the wood and walked in. I don't know if he had any clue of what he was doing. I think it had been a long time since he had been attacking someone since he left Colorado. I think he was at a frenzy point. I don't, I don't, it wasn't his regular MO. It wasn't him being clear on what he usually does. It was him frantic, I think. And for him to go upstairs into the sorority house, it makes me think that he may have already been in the house before. So um, that was just my, you know, how did he know what, stairway to go to to get to this hallway so that's just something i um i didn't know because people came in and out of the sorority a lot um guys with their girlfriends and just um no guys were ever allowed upstairs so to see one up there would have been totally you know irregular so someone would have said that but for him to walk up and try that first door that was unlocked and he attacked margaret i think he was just overwhelmed he was an animal and then he rushed across the hall and attacked lisa and he bit her like an animal because he wasn't doing his regular mo he wasn't just doing it for the thrill he was doing it at a necessity i think and both of those uh women had one person in their room their roommates were both out so only one person in the room and then when he came to our room he opened the door and there were two of us in the room but i don't think it mattered to him he was just he was just gone he was just at a rage and by attacking me, I think he thought the first blow would have killed me because it was so hard. And then when my roommate started moving, he was like, oh, my goodness, there's two of them. I can get both of them now. So I think he was just heightened alert and in a in a rage. And then when he did run out the door, I think he just completely ran and ran away. And it actually is when he ran down the street and went to another of the um, victim's houses, Cheryl Thomas, and attacked her that night. Was there a sense of uh, heightened s smell or, you know, when in trauma, you know, when everything starts to slow down and everything else starts to multiply itself, did you have a sense of smell or anything like that uh, no. about him or, okay. No, nothing okay. like that. One thing they did do was when I was in Tallahassee in the hospital and it was over a week later, there was to fly me from Tallahassee to the airport mm -hmm. to Miami to recuperate. And as I got in the car at the hospital, it was uh, unmarked cars taking me. It was one in front of the other, my parents in one. And they stopped right in front of the Cayo house. And I'm like, what? <laughs> and they said, we want you to go in to see if anything's missing, to see if you can identify something gone as he would might take as a trophy. And I'm like, I really don't want to go up there. And it took an officer on each elbow walking me up the stairs and as I walked up, I saw Margaret's room with the yellow tape. And I saw Lisa's room on the other side with the tape. And I saw my door with the tape. And they let me go in. And they look, I looked at my dresser. The furniture was all on one side of the wall. I looked at my dresser. And I couldn't even tell you what was there to see what was missing. And I looked at my desk. I looked at the footboard of my bed. And then I looked at my bed. And now it was brown. It was stained with brown my comforter, which I just picked out and loved. That was in just in a ball, all brown and nasty. And I looked at my bed. The sheets were off, but the mattress was all stained and brown. And there was blood on the walls. And I looked at that and I took a deep breath and said, 
I know now where this happened. I can, I don't have to visualize it and think did it happen. It happened right here. It happened to me. Now I'm ready to go home. And that was, I think it was healthy for me. A lot of people don't want their victims to go back to the site or it'll hurt them or something. But, you know, Ken Casares, the sheriff, when I told him, I saw him a couple of years ago, we kept in touch. Um, I told him what they did and he's like, oh my God, I would never allow that to have happened. And in my case, it happened and I was appreciated. Fascinating. Uh, on, on that dovetail, I, you just kicked something in my mind. Post-trial, after it was all over, was there anything you wanted back? I mean, we talk about these savages getting a trophy, but how about you from a victim's position? Is there anything that gave you comfort that you may have wanted to get back? Uh, from your room that evening that the police may have had in custody? No, I walked away from it. I, I didn't okay. need, I didn't need anything from there. It was okay. taken away and I didn't want it. They could keep it. Okay. Did any of the other survivors, if, if you know? I do not so? know since I was in not no contact. I'm sure they all kept their Chi Omega stuff and, you know, had all their trophies and, and everything. And actually, uh, a box was sent down to my house. They boxed everything up, the sorority sisters, and sent it to a box in Miami. And my mother had it in the attic for a long time. When I got married and moved, she gave it to my husband at the point and put it up in the attic. And one day I went up there and found it. I just sat on the floor in the attic and just looked at everything. I didn't cry. I just remembered when I got it. Oh, I remember this. I remember when I got that. And it was weird because I wasn't crying. Oh, I got this and it's gone. You know, it was just therapeutic for me to look at it and be happy when I got it. And then when I got a divorce, my ex-husband threw everything away. He knew what was in the boxes and he threw everything away. So right now I have nothing, you know, no, nothing but the um, newspaper articles. My mother clipped every newspaper article she could find. She didn't want me to hear the stories over and over and over and read it and read it. So we didn't listen to the news at home. And I opened up the newspaper to read and there'd be articles cut out just <laughs> all over the paper. It's hard for me to read anything. And mama saved all these. In the process of writing the book, I found a box that had a lot of hundreds of, of articles that she cut out of the newspaper from the day of the trial. I mean, I'm sorry, the day of the attack through the trial, through the execution, there was just a lot to go with. And that gave me a lot of background information also on how things occurred during the time frame. So that was like very useful. It's like sitting down and talking with her at that point. But I found that very, very beneficial for me. Interesting. Dean and then Dr. Picado. You know, Kathy, you, you mentioned that a couple of times uh, about the presence of law enforcement. You, you talked about it specifically that night when the officer came into your room, and then you talked about it again um, when you were in the hospital um, and there was a police officer there. Can, can you talk a little bit about just the power of that presence? I know it's not, a lot of times we think about what can people say and do, but maybe a little more about that. Okay. When I woke up and the police were there, when they're first called, it was, I don't know that I passed out or just closed my eyes. And I guess it's a passed out. Uh, it wasn't for long. It was just until I heard a commotion again. And I was still scrunched up in my smallest little ball I could be and had my eyes just shut. And then when the light went down again, when that bright light left the room and went down again, it was black. I thought for sure he was still going to come back and get me even after I saw him leave the room, you know, scramble out the room. And then I was being noticed by someone else standing next to me and I was afraid. And then he pulled the covers down, said, it's okay. I'm a police officer. I'm going to take care of you. It's okay. And I did. I felt such relief that I knew he was going to protect me and that no one was going to come in the room and hit me again. And I found that so reassuring. And he held my hand. The paramedics were working on me. And he held my hand that whole time because I didn't want him to leave me. And as I was carried out of the um, the house and carried on the stretcher, the cop was same cop was still holding my hand. And when they put me into the ambulance, the last thing I saw before they closed the door was the officer. And that was just 
remarkable to me that one person that one person gave me so much comfort through different stages of the night and, and leaving the house. Wow. Thank you. Gary, Dr. Bricado. Um, there were some comments that you made in response to some, some of the questions, Kathy, that kind of got back to some of the, the questions I had raised earlier. And I just wanted to ask a couple of things for, okay. for clarification. So, so one thing that I always wondered about in this situation is, did they give you a pen and paper and try to get you to describe what happened? I mean, since you were unable to talk, I mean, for example, in the, in the infamous case of another serial offender, Tommy Lynn Sells, there was also an attack on multiple girls sleeping in beds and, there was a girl called um, uh, uh, Searles was the last name, 10 years old, and and the throat had been cut. And the neighbors had the 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 wherewithal to pull out paper and a pen and have her write out what happened. And they were able to go and kind of quickly catch this guy that had come in through the window uh, yeah. or screen. And um, did they did they try a technique like that, or, or was it just like you couldn't talk, so they thought you had been shot and didn't get the details? What did they, they do? At, at right at the house, um, at in the hospital, when I went into the ER, there were officers all around me and questioning, "Who did this? Do you know who did this?" And you know, I'm still in the trauma stage, not even um, being helped yet. And, you know, I'm just saying, I don't know. I don't know. Did you see him before? Have you ever met him before? And I'm just like, I don't know. And then the drugs kicked in and I oh. didn't know. <laughs> right. And then um, it was up in my room when the police were still trying to get information from me when I was hypnotized. And yes, I used paper. Wow. And I also could hear myself talk, you know, like talking like this with your teeth clenched. I could hear myself saying what I wanted to say and get it out on paper or just letting them get right close to me and hearing what I was saying. But they're the ones that helped me know what happened because they fed it back to me, what I had said and what I was trying to say. So you had the use of your hands for, you could yes. communicate that way for all yes. those, that period when you were recovering yes. the ability to speak. And um, it's it's very interesting. I, I guess you're, you're doing that still with the writing the book, I guess. And, the, and, um, and um, the other thing is, um, you referenced, you, you said something very, very interesting that you wondered if Bundy had been in that house before because of the familiarity with the layout. And this gets back to the question I had asked earlier, which is, do you think it was just a random attack of somebody on a kind of a spree where he goes there and then up the block and the whole, or do you think that it was targeted because he had seen you know, the young women living there and or thought there was some vulnerability. I'm just curious about that, because that's a very interesting statement about having been in there before. I think both both things you said are correct. I think he was on a frenzy. He wanted to do this and he didn't know um, where to go. And the woman that he targeted after us was someone that they say that Bundy was stalking or followed around or that he wanted to get her. And she wasn't home that night. So uh, her car was gone. So that's when he came to the sorority house. And I think the back door was open. It was accessible for him. He he followed the girls. He hid until they went in. And that's when he picked up the oak and came in. But I think he was at a frenzy, too. I think he it was like, I'm getting someone. I'm getting someone tonight. And I think that's how he went in and, and really processed everything was he was going to do it no matter what. He okay. had to do it. This is so interesting. And I and I, I think other people in the panel are going to want to weigh in on this, but this is very reminiscent of stories of other offenders that have a person they're targeting and are extremely angry that that person, you know, bedevils them by not coming home or, right. you know, changing their patterns or whatever. And then they sort of go and randomly target one person or a bunch of people to sort of get the need met. Yeah. And um, I, I wonder if other people have thoughts or comments about that, but, but, I, I can certainly think of a few offenders that did that. Um, anyone else have any thoughts on that? Well, just following up on that, Gary, I think that's consistent with what we've seen where an offender will select a substitute victim uh, as an example to the preferred victim. And 
whether it be somebody that they knew that they were stalking, that they'd targeted and out of their frustration, but their uh, determination and commitment to commit the crime, say in this situation that night or that particular time when they've selected to do that. They'll oftentimes select substitute victims that there was no real significant relationship that they had had with them necessarily. It could be somebody walking down the street, a complete stranger, just in the wrong time, the wrong place. Yeah. And be selected that way as a substitute. I had a quick question about the inside of the house, Kathy, is were there lights on? I was also intrigued that you thought maybe he had been in before was a it was a back door right he that, came in yeah yeah and then and then did you have to go upstairs or were you on what level were you on when you came in the back door when you first came door. in the back yeah you were on the first level and it was a big rec room with the fireplace and if it had been dark then usually we had a light in there but if it had been dark you would not have been able to see but most of the do sisters left the light on Okay, so, so there's not, and then did he have to go upstairs? Yes, he had to go into the foyer from the back of the house to the front of the house by the foyer. And then right there were stairs. And he walked up those stairs and there was a hallway that went to the left and a hallway that went to the right. And he chose the one that went to the right, which was our hallway. And I think, I don't know how far he would have gone that night with doors not being locked and him trying them. If he had been successful in killing us, you know, there's no way of knowing how many he would have killed that night, but he did. I think he may have known because there were other stairwells, other stair places they could go up. So he almost knew right there and right upstairs was where he wanted to be. So did the hallway have a, a light? That was that we have been told. And, um, the light was on, but it was turned off. It was um, turned off by the bulb. And so it was oh. very dark. It was very dark in a hallway. And the light was on earlier when another, all these stories coming to get put together. Oh. A sorority sister had seen the light on when she went to the restroom. So how did he see? When he opened your door, there yeah, was our, no light. Right? right. Our windows were open, our curtains. And you got the ambient light from outside that illuminated the room enough that he could he could okay. see, but he didn't know the trunk was between the beds. He couldn't see that. Yeah, couldn't the see that. Locker. Okay. Thank you. Yes. Any other follow up to any of the other experts on the panel that you all may have? I, I, I it's my understanding that Bundy had been at a dance or something and had been rejected by a college girl who kind of told me he's an old man and, you know, get lost. And that is sort of what precipitated his frenzy that night is it, things were not going well. He would, he was not um, able to support himself without theft. He had been frustrated. And then for, it was kind of the final straw for her to kind of push him away. Like you, you know, you're an old guy. What are you doing here? Uh, which is not, I think, how he wanted to think of himself. And that's what led him to go follow some girls out. Yes. Interesting. That adds, that adds a creepy here. symbolism to targeting Kimberly Leach. Yeah. Uh, the, the idea of, uh, I'm closer to her in age than, uh, you know, the, yeah, this, uh, than being an old man uh, sort of makes it, gives me the, the chills to think about. When he came, kidnapped Kimberly Leach, he had gone to her school. School was getting out, and he had his white van, which was stolen. And he went and said, get in this car. And she goes, no, I don't want to get in your car. People saw that, and someone in particular says, oh, I thought it was, you know, she did something at school, and her father's mad at her, and making her get into the van. And he walked off, not knowing that it was Bundy going to attack her. Yeah, uh, wow. you know, um, it that makes me think of something that has been going through my head during this meeting. Had you ever heard of Bundy before these attacks? Reading no. about him in the news, anything at all? No, I was at college, sophomore at college, having fun. I, you know, it wasn't on my radar at all. Sadly to say, I wasn't up with the news. <laughs> right. But no, I had never heard of his name. 
Right. And even if you had, my guess is you would have associated with a different part of the country. Yes. Not. I, yeah. Right. So it wasn't like people were on high alert. Uh, no. to be lucky. And was it a high crime or low crime kind of area? I mean, were there any, I mean, you, you had the door unlocked. Yeah. So was that yeah. typical of the, the time and place? Well, we had our door unlocked in the sorority house. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, off and on, I wanted to lock it, but I was told, who are you afraid of, your sorority sisters? So that kind of um, set the scene for that. But yeah, the sorority was, I mean, the campus was pretty safe. We had our, you know, our amount of um, people being attacked and stuff, but it wasn't like a high crime area. Yeah. yeah. By the way, is that building still there or did they... Did the university tear it down or what? The Cayo House yeah. was actually taken down and re, uh, put back up. It's beautiful. So it doesn't even look like the house. They redid it, and it's just like a gorgeous southern mansion. Have you visited the spot, or you've just seen it on the internet or something? I actually went back to the sorority. Oh. Um, it was about 1980. Oh. My, I was with my husband and his friends, and we were going to go watch a football game. Florida State game. And I wanted to go by the sorority house. And I'll, that's all I said. I wanted to go by the sorority house. And as I did, they parked and got me out and said, go ahead and go on in. We'll be back later. We're going to get a beer. So they took off and I'm standing on the sidewalk on the side of the street. And I looked at the house and it was totally different. I didn't know what was what was going on. But I walked up slowly, and as I did, I could see this is the same house. My mind had turned it into something else. So right. when I started walking up the pavement to the front door, it was my baby steps. <laughs> Literally, I had to take baby steps to get in there. And as I did, I walked in, and I asked for a sorority sister, and there, you know, no one knew with what I was, whom I was talking about. They were all getting ready for the game and moving around and stuff. So I walked up. And I went up the stairs that I used to cringe going up again after the attack. And I went up and went into my room. I opened the door and it was so bright and so airy and the curtains were open and the walls were white and the girls had decorated it so cute. It was a deep breath of, yeah, things continue. Things keep going on. And I took my breath. I took it with me and I went back and sat on the curb waiting to get my beer. <laughs> Oh, oh, I love it. Yeah. That's great. That's a, the, yes. The, what year was that? Symbolism. Yeah. Kathy, what year was that? That was in 1980. And then it was about two years after the attack. Two years after. Yeah. Yeah. I, I thought I wanted to make yeah. sure. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Last on um, 2020, I think it was, um, I went with a um, TV station was doing a show for me. And they took me back to Tallahassee to walk around and see if I had any weird feelings or anything. And we went to the hall. I was in a dormitory um, when I first um, went in as a freshman. I was in a dormitory and my mother hated that. She was just so afraid that, you know, anything could happen to me in a dormitory. It wasn't safe. So that's why when I graduate and when I I'm sorry, the year of 78 went. And in 1977 summer, it was time for me to go back to school. My parents arranged for me to move into the sorority house at that point because they thought it was safer living there than in the dormitory. So in the fall of 77 is when I moved into the house. And that's when I got my bedspread and had my room all pretty, ready to go. And it was January the 15th when I got attacked of 78. And I can't imagine how bad my parents must have felt putting me in harm's way like that and made the arrangements to do it. It wasn't like, yeah, there's a room for her. it was they had to do something to get me in that house. Interesting. If you're just joining us, uh, we're we've been speaking with Kathy Kleiner Rubin, who is the author of a great new book that's just hitting the bookshelf. So we're going to make her a number one bestseller. For the New York Times, where and is that your is that your book over your shoulder there? Well, okay. oh look, it is <laughs> perfect. Can can you reach one and hold it up to the camera yeah. so everybody can see it? I didn't it's even called know it a was light, there. Let's see. A light in the dark. You can and it's available now on Amazon, right? Yes. Or yes. everywhere. It came out on the third, anywhere. 
You can get it at any okay. outlook store. It's a light in the dark, and the surviving more than Ted Bundy. Okay, so this is the only memoir to challenge the po the popular notion as Bundy as a handsome, you know, charming killer who you know all the victims trusted. I, I this is you are are a amazing human being uh, to write this about your life and your experience at the you know at the hands of this savage. Um, I so I'm going to turn some time over to you, Kathy. Here's. Here's something I haven't done yet, but this is the first time it just hit me while I've been listening to you. You know, the panel that you have in front of you uh, on this program here tonight, you know, there's a ton of experience and information about this. So I want to turn some time over to you to ask them anything you want to just you can just say Dr. Bercato, Dr. Burgess, and I know Dr. Ramsey, you know as a friend, whoever, from your position about something that may, you know, have been here for a while and that you want to know about, if that helps. Um, yes, it does. Dr. Bercato, uh, what what do you think about my story? Is, have you met other victims like this that have helped themselves? Mm. You know, um, because victims are, despite what some of these offenders want to believe, are diverse human beings, their reactions can be very different. And um, some of the extremely resilient people who come from supportive backgrounds, who have spiritual beliefs or can make existential meaning out of what happened to them, who are altruistically inclined, who are given an opportunity by the world to be, uh, uh, you know, to kind of use a megaphone of the media or something else to speak to people, uh, you know, you 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 have those characteristics, and obviously, you know, you were able to take this awful thing and to turn it toward other people. Um, have I met other people like that? Yes, certainly. The the Cold Case Foundation, uh, yeah. you know, uh, uh, yeah. has encountered plenty of people like that. Um, there are also other people who are a lot more afraid, a lot more traumatized. Um, their lives are absolutely in pieces. Uh, and um, it is extremely, extremely um, inspirational to people like that um, to hear, you know, what you have overcome, what you've been able to do. There are people in this audience tonight, I guarantee you, who have been victims of violent crime. There may be people here who have been afraid to even tell people that they've been victimized, who, who have information that may lead to someone getting captured or arrested or taken off the street or whatever, and they're absolutely petrified. So there's no small feat what you are doing. But absolutely, yes, I have encountered people like that, and they, they never cease to amaze me. Um, I wonder uh, what other people's thoughts are on that, but I've certainly been very, very inspired. Uh, Greg, Dean, Ann, Catherine, Chris, anyone? Well, from my perspective, you you are, are a tremendous model and an example to would be uh, survivors and, and uh, what otherwise could be going on in their lives of uh, of those who are having a very, very difficult time, more difficult time dealing with it. Uh, I think you give hope and a sense of confidence. You speak with such confidence and determination. Um, and that comes from who you are as an individual and your character. Uh, thank you for sharing that. And I think it reinforces the concept to other victims uh, that you can be a victor versus being a victim after experiencing such a horrible, horrible event in, in your life. And uh, it gives great hope and confidence for others. Well, I hope I've helped you all to understand maybe a victim more, um, to see what they need in the beginning, the very catch them and help them in the beginning. Um, it's at that time where I think they can decide, yeah, I'm going to get through it or no. And I never thought of it as no, I wouldn't get through it. It was hard. It was my little island that saved me because it took me so long to get to that island. And one other thing was um, I was afraid of men. Right after yeah. the attack, I was not like 
they're going to kill me, but just I was uncomfortable around men I didn't know. And once I got my wired, my mouth um, opened up, I went to work at a lumber yard because I figured, where am I going to see the most men at the, you know, as fast as I could to make sure I'm, I'm going to get over this. And I think I worked there three weeks and decided that, you know, not all men are going to, you know, hurt me. And that there's a lot of cute construction guys that go to lumber yards. <laughs> so at that point, you know, that was just something else that I visualized and actually did to help help myself to move on. Uh, yeah, so did like you have any? Like, go ahead, Em, please. No, I was going to say, I, mean, I think that what you just said is, is so characteristic of you, of how you are able to find uh, events in the in the in your life that you could just take and move on. I, that's really rather remarkable. Thank you. Uh, My mom didn't like it at the time. <laughs> uh, but I also wonder uh, how much having that experience where you described kind of passing out and then waking up and where is he and, and that whole gestalt and then having the hypnosis as a way to help you recover whatever memory you could. I, I, I don't think we use that too much nowadays. I, um, I could be wrong, but I I, uh, I just found that really, no. really interesting. That they, I'm wondering how they would see that. I could see where, uh, like a defense lawyer might say, well, what you were, they, they put things in your mind to, to that, you know, you really didn't remember that. But so what I found it fascinating where you did remember mm -hmm pretty uh well we, we don't know anyone else that um would would have challenged that right no my yeah. roommate was there she passed out and when she woke up is when she went to into the hallway to get us help so but she said she passed out i don't know how long she was out before she went and got us help was she hit yes she hit, hit her, her with the same club yeah too. yeah Right. I mean, his whole behavior is, is very, I will have time tonight, but just looking at, at Bundy's behavior coming in and, and all that and where he had been and so forth is quite interesting also to try to put the whole picture together. But uh, thank you so much. I oh, think you're welcome. Nice to talk to you. Helpful. So, Kathy, one, one other thought for me, and then what we'll do is we'll go around the, the room, kind of wrap it up, and then uh, it will come back to you for the final word. Uh, and then we always like to leave on a positive note here uh, in totality because you have inspired so many uh, people here this evening. Uh, we go to Hawaii. We have a little song that we put on and it takes us over to Hawaii and gives us the uh, aloha spirit, for lack of a better term. But nice. my, my, my final question to you is, is from my perspective, what would you like to share uh, with the world about your sorority sisters who did not survive? Can you tell me about them? It hurts. It hurts. It took 10 years for Bundy to be executed for their deaths. And he kept on. Um, Bundy was um, found guilty and sentenced to be executed. It took 10 years. And I don't understand this, but he got four stays of execution during that time. And I, I, I know the process. I just don't get it. Anyway, uh, Margaret and Lisa didn't have 10 more years. They didn't have an extension on their life just because he kept getting extensions on his, on his death sentence. Um, I, that, that bothers me. Um, final word, Greg, we'll start with you and then we'll go to Dr. Picado, Dean, um, and then we'll leave Dr. Ramsland and Dr. Burgess and, um, uh, then Kathy, you, you can share your message if that's okay with you. I would like to thank you. Okay. Well, wonderful. Well, once again, Kathy, thank you so much for your, your candor and, and your openness, your honesty and your integrity. Um, and I think, uh, from my perspective, personally, I think uh, a takeaway for me is the power of a person's independent will to choose how 
they will respond to a situation. And, and the, the level of influence uh, and magnitude that that will have on the ability of an individual to survive. Uh, thank you. You're a great example to all of us. Thank you, sir. My turn uh, to go, I think. Uh, um, well, I mean, what what can one say after a story like this? Uh, it's extremely moving. I I um I'm inspired. I think that it is in a lot of ways reinvented the way that I sort of thought about that night and what happened there and what might have precipitated it and all of that. And um, what happened afterwards certainly really brings the story to life. Um, I also think there's a tremendous amount of symbolism in so many aspects of the story with the light and uh, of course, uh, shining in the darkness and um, even the symbolism of going to work in the lumber yard after being attacked with a, with a log uh, that you go from men who choose to use wood violently to those who use it to construct uh and and being able to kind of um find peace in that um one of the things i'm hoping you can touch on when it comes to be your turn for the final statement is the advocacy work that you do um i it sounds like that's a very important part of your life now uh and um i'd love i'd love it if you tell us a little bit about the work you do and i would also love it if you'd be willing to stay in touch because of some of the work we do, where it might be so helpful to have you as a voice. Uh, and, um, and I'd be curious if you'd be open to that. I would definitely, any questions or anything I can help on a particular thing or a victim that I might have help you to get through with or to help, you know, heal better. I, I'm here anytime. Great, great. Thank you. Of course. Well, Kathy, well, what a night, and uh, thank you so much for just being so open and transparent tonight, and uh, I, I think uh, Chris mentioned it earlier as well, but, you know, your statement of maybe being a victim on the first night, but the second night you were a survivor, and I think it goes to that core factor of, you know, people forget they have choices, right, and uh, we don't always, things happen in our life that we didn't choose, but how we respond to them and how we move forward, uh, we have a choice and, and to listen to your journey and the choices you've made all the way along at each one of those intervals um, is a testimony uh, and a great mo roadmap, I think, for uh, people who are dealing with similar circumstances. So thank you so much. It was an honor to be here tonight. Thank you. I think it's my my turn. Um, my takeaway is a couple of things. One, I was impressed on how talking helps, that you didn't get a chance initially. Uh, right now, we like to think that we get people in to help and talk and so forth, but you on your own were able to say how that was so important for you. So that's a plus. And then I think the other important thing is how we have to get, if we can, the victim's view of that night. And it isn't always just the offender. And we so often just get the offender side without getting the victim side. And I think you're making us have to rethink some of what we had heard, or certainly for my part, what I had heard about Bundy, that this puts, puts it in a very different perspective. And I always like to always try to get the victim side and then the offender side. So we will have to work on, at least I will, on reconceptualizing this whole situation. And I think the third takeaway is my surprise at how some of the reactions were from, say, your sorority, from the university to this. I know it was 1978, which, of course, is obviously not 2023, but the change that maybe or maybe not has occurred over these intervening years. So I, I uh, very much appreciate and certainly hope that we can keep in touch with uh, maybe Zoom you in to talk to my students uh, next semester when we would be taking up uh, Ted Bundy. Thank you very much. Thank you. So yes. thank you. Yes. Good night, Anne.
Good night. Hi. So, hi. Hi. Uh, I'm, this is the first time I'm on this panel. I don't know why everybody disappeared, but I guess we're supposed to <laughs> <laughs> X ourselves out. Yeah. Um, but, you know, my statement to you, we, I knew you before you wrote the book. We talked about writing. We talked about, um, you know, what you could do to pursue it. I'm glad you did pursue it. Uh, good for you. It's a hard road to relive and work a manuscript over and over and over. And over. Um, kudos to your your co-writer. So, uh, But I'm happy to see it, it finally came to fruition and that you're out there uh, doing, you know, what you need to do with this. So great. Congratulations. It was important for you, you being here tonight. Thank you. Thank you. I guess I have to have to X out. <laughs> I'm not sure. Hi, my name is Kathy Kleiner Rubin. I am the co I'm sorry, the writer of A Light in the Dark, Surviving More Than Ted Bundy. It, I wrote it with my co-author, Emily Lebeau Lacousi. She is a wonderful artist, a wonderful writer. She took all my thoughts and wrote them down on paper and told my story with um, with my words in her writing, which was amazing. I am um, I'm glad I've survived what I have and I'm helping people by telling my story and by telling them this, maybe they can help someone else or maybe they can help them. I have many people who come to me and say they could never do it, that I, it's not possible for them to process and do the things that I have done. And to that, I say, you can do it. It might be very hard. It might seem not worth it, but you can take care of yourself. You can do what you need to do and feel good about it. If it's baby steps that you need to do, find a little island, find a goal, find something you want or need and just walk toward it and let that be your goal. And when you get there and when you attach yourself to that goal, you can feel good about yourself and know you've walked a little bit away from what is being bothering you, what attacked you, what you're going through. It doesn't matter because you have to depend on yourself to walk through and go to find the next thing that's good for you in this life. You're not here to do it alone. There's people that can help you. You have to always know that the world needs you. Just because you're feeling damaged or you're hurt, that's okay. But you need to get better for the world. They need to know that you're here and that they can help you be here. Along with the things that we discussed tonight, I did mention that I had my breast cancer when I was um, 32 diagnosed with stage two breast cancer. I had a radical mastectomy, which gave me chemo again. And um, that to me, that was the worst thing I've been through was having to take chemo twice in my life. But I understood that by taking care of myself, by healing with medicine, by taking care of what the doctors told me to do and what not to do, I got strong again. And I did it because I wanted to. I wanted to do it for those around me who needed me to be there for them. When I was diagnosed with lupus at 13, one of the things I was told was I was never supposed to have children. That was one of the things that would activate the lupus again in my system. Well, my son just turned 42 years old. He was born in 1981 and he's the best thing that's happened to me. He's more well and healthy and my big boy that gave me two beautiful grandchildren. When I talk and, and talk to groups, I just want to let them hear what I say. And then I want them to talk, talk about it. I found that's my biggest thing I can offer is to get the help you needed. Go over it in your mind and take care of yourself to resolve it. When I talk to groups, they want to hear about how I've done things and I can give them suggestions, but they need to do it themselves. And many people have come up to me since I've been speaking out and saying how much they appreciate and that I have helped them. I hope so. I hope I can help people. By reading my book, A Light in the Dark, Surviving More Than Ted Bundy, it'll help you understand more about who I am and who I was going to be without being attacked. I had no clue in school at that point, but Bundy's attack put me through a new, a new life 
a new segment of what I was going to be doing next. I never went back to school. I never went back to FSU. I went and took another role in my life. I, I got married and had my baby. So um, that was more important to me then. And life changes. You may be doing one thing and it might be hard for you. And you need to get out of that. And you need to do it yourself. You need to grasp that that strength inside of you and understand that you can do it. You really can. It might take slow, but think good about yourself. You're the only one can help yourself. Be happy. Be happy with the little accomplishments. If you can go out and see a flower today and yesterday you couldn't leave the house, that's big. That's a big accomplishment. And that may be your goal is every day work a little further out of the house until you're not scared to go out. You don't have any fear that something's going to happen to you, that you're going to get whole again. After I was diagnosed with breast cancer, I had um, two miscarriages. I wanted to have a baby again, and it just wasn't, it wasn't in for me to have a baby. So I um, went ahead and had the two miscarriages and went to um, the decision not to have a baby anymore. So my husband and I went out and bought a sailboat and we called her Sally. So that was our new baby in life. And it seemed like that was okay. I was okay with that, that we were going to start doing different things. I actually have a motorcycle and we go motorcycle riding and life's great. And I always say to look forward to the next hurdle because it's going to be something in front of you. Keep running till you can cross over it. And now I say walk really, really fast because you don't know what the next hurdle is going to hold for you. But look around it and look and see if it's something good because there probably is going to be something good there. I hope you enjoyed my speak to, speaking tonight and I look forward to having comments. I can be reached on uh, Kleiner Kathy Gmail and I'm also on Facebook, which is where you can find um, links to the book to be bought through Amazon or any of the other booksellers. So I hope you have a good evening. Thank you for listening to me and Godspeed and good night. Hard working every day. I'm stressed out 24-7, babe. No, no time outs. Wish we could fly away. You and I. Go to our favorite place Oh yeah, yeah Make special memories Together I'll be your company Now and forever I'll say we fly away You and me Go to our favorite place Feeling the sun on my face in a while Facing away